Oh my gosh, look at the, look at the bike. You guys seen it? Look at the bike! Well, one of the things we are trying to do here, we have a really tight urban lot, at least for Minneapolis, it's a tight urban mm -hmm. lot, which is, I think, 34 feet wide or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to fit a garage in here and slide a parking space and a, and a drive in there. So it meant that the house itself was 24 or 25 mm -hmm. feet wide. Right. So there really is just barely enough room to fit the car in there. I want to say it's like 11 feet or something like that. And you can see the condition where the eight foot garage door is sort of tucked in there. How wide is it? Six feet? Is it five or six? I can't remember what the rule was. They said structure to structure. I think we needed at least, at least five. At least five. Yeah, I think for fire code, you need some of that. And then I think actually we had to get a variance because I think it was supposed to be at least 10 or maybe even 20 feet, you know. Yeah, nice. the, the driveway is nine feet wide. And so we had 25 by 35 for mm -hmm. the house yep. footprint. And then we like wanted to make it feel really open and spacious. And so, you know, we just sort of started out by this just, well, let's just think about it as a big open barn-like space. And so this is what's left over after we kind of chunked everything out. So this lookout window. The idea of kind of having a little tree house <laughs> within your house was, was really attractive. <laughs> we originally wanted to do the Wee House, a prefab house, but once Alchemy came and looked at the lot, and since it is small, they thought stick building a structure would be better use of space. And we didn't want to put like a metal box or a glass box in the middle of all these traditional homes. Yeah. So you can kind of see everything is very triangular and... Kind of an iconic house shape. Yeah. So the uh, city of Minneapolis requires any new house built, you have to build a garage. And we didn't have a budget for it. We didn't have any dollars off. We didn't realize how expensive it was going to be to build a garage, a stick build one. So I found this, this is a, a prefab kit that you can buy. You give them the specs of the space and the size and then a truck from Canada comes down with everything in pieces and then we built the structure with Joe's friends and family over a weekend and it's just all these bolts. Yeah, it's basically just like a giant erector set. We were kind of on the fence with, with how this was going to turn out but um, it's super functional and it just looks really cool. We yeah. got a lot of people in the neighborhood coming, coming by. Asking, you know, what is that thing back there? Is that a greenhouse? It's a, it's a Quonset hut, you know, just like it'll, a... It'll fit two cars, too. It's like kind of shotgun style. There it is, Quonset hut. Got a bucket of bolts, a bunch of people, and some pizza. And that's how you put up a Quonset hut. We built all the arches separately first, and then you raise them and just connect them together until yeah. you have this curved structure. And then the end walls go on last. Yeah, it was like 36 hours of labor and it was up. Really fun. We're gonna drop this right here. Yep. A lot of times they, farm. they build these kind of Quonset huts for mm -hmm. farm equipment and... Man caves. There's a lot of architects that are working with this company because they'll customize it to however you need. And it ends up being about a sixth of the cost of like a traditionally stick-built garage. We were quoted for like a traditional garage build for like $40,000. 30 to 40,000. To do a single stall shotgun, like double deep. Yeah. But for this, I think it was like 6,000. 6,000 probably, not including this, the concrete foundation. That we had in the budget, but for the structure itself, about 6,000. Huge. Yeah. Really yeah. big. I mean, yeah, it, it feels really tall. So we got one, two, three, four, five panels that uh, all connect together to make one arch. And once you have the arches constructed on the ground, all right, same thing. Connor, I go yeah. no, really. then you just raise those up and bolt those together. So it's really just a simple, repetitious process of arch 
you build all bolt the arches, on, arch, <laughs> bolt it on, and then yeah. connect them really together. Gorgeous. This coating that you see, the one thing that the city wasn't sure of, because nobody in the city of Minneapolis has ever built a, steel, a raw steel structure like this, so they didn't know how to get it to pass fire code. Yeah, we needed to establish a one hour firewall. A one hour firewall. And, and they didn't know how to tell us how to, they're like, we don't know how to tell you how to do it, but if you can figure it out, you let us know. And so I was reaching out to these like steel engineer groups of America yeah. and like all these different like groups and like just reaching out to engineers and like, here's my situation, what do you think? And some were like, I don't know. And some were really helpful. I've spent about two months researching, but in the end, I found this intumescent paint, which is a type of coating that contractors traditionally use on steel structure, internal structures. So commercial building, steel beams, exposed ceilings, ex exposed ceilings. Commercial buildings. this is what they coat on it to give it that, to make it fire rated. And so we found the product and presented it to the city. We also presented stick frame, like building sheet inside, rocking. like sheet rocking inside of here would have defeated the whole purpose of the structure. But we wanted to give them options to show we were diligent. So they, they approved either option and they said, yep, what, whichever way you want to do, we'll approve it. So we had to get this on here, paint it on, and it had to be a certain thickness. But we only needed that back wall and half of the structure because we're less than five feet from him, from our neighbor. Because it's so tight, you have to protect your structure. Like if they have a fire and it spreads, we have to make sure that, you know, the fire doesn't spread to us or it'll stop. So that's why we did the minimum, just because uh, eventually maybe we could coat it, but it was a painstaking process to get that coating on. Here's the corner piece. It was such a tight for the garage, so um, in case yeah. we were to hit the house, you hit the metal. It's really close, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah it's you close. Take fit. You gotta turn a little bit. You gotta angle out, but this is like the minimum you can be for code, for because if you have a detached garage uh, for code, you have to be at what five or six feet or whatever. So this is like the minimal, like the bare minimum we just squeezed in. The siding, it's called a rain screen. You can kind of see that black protective material at the bottom. So that's actually like a weatherproof protective barrier. And then that truly acts as the siding. And then they put furring strips. So there's kind of a grid of wood that they put on, the, on top of that black. And then this goes on top of that. So there's actually a space between it and it lets it breathe. Sort of this like living material and helps with the longevity of it those barns you see that have been there for 100, 150 years standing, you know, it's like that except better. The barn wood is both one by and two by structures. We actually used a very so-called low grade pine. In this case, I think was green and hit the knots or some of the knots anyway, and then stained it and knew that it would weather. And so but we didn't worry about the nails and uh, it's got a great kind of texture and kind of changes with the light as well too. The barn house kind of affords a simple exterior shape and then it kind of lets us do whatever we want inside. On the too. inside, yeah. yeah. So that's how we were able to kind of have some more open spaces. and You just kind of create this shell and then you can kind of do whatever you want inside of it. And even, you know, we sacrificed, you sacrificed having an extra bedroom on the upper level, but it would have felt like a completely different house if we were to close off, you know, the ceiling over here. And it makes it feel larger than it is. It feels big but it's not. And we were able to do everything on a really tight budget. The kitchen, it's the showroom samples. So when they tore them down, they sold them for like 70% off. The tricky thing was is that we had to transport it all finished from there to not here because we, we didn't know when we were gonna be able to install the kitchen. So we had to bring it to my sister's basement and she stored it for like, 10 months and then our contractor kind of did these little hacks just to sort of warm it up a little bit and you worked in 
you know, the light wood yeah, tone here, yeah, we to and that thing, mm -hmm. and that thing, and mm -hmm. so, and then worked it in here to mm -hmm. kind of just make it a little less serious. Just well, and I, I remembered when the guys were putting this together, um, I remembered where they got the wood. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get the same wood, so it'll age the same. I see that there's a little bit of... Um... Yeah, the barn house exterior yeah. on the island. It also connects to the stairs. So this, again, is extra siding material, same materials outside. And then the staircase, we didn't want to do carpet, carpet but, you know, beautiful walnut floating steps break the also bank. Also a budget problem. Also a budget problem. So they're just steel treads, diamonds, just kind of like what you see in an industrial setting. It's like at the car shop. It's kind of an industrial barn house, so it was kind of the perfect material to integrate. And then up here is where our bedrooms are. So this is our bedrooms. We also wanted to take advantage of this window and have bring light. You know, if you look around the entire house, we don't have a ton of lighting. And so we cut out a lot of the ceiling lights and we're like, let's just live with the sun as much as we can. On this level and mainly on the lower level, when it's really sunny out, the garage reflects a lot of light. So we get a lot of extra light kind of bouncing in. So there are window restrictions. These are just code things. So we kind of had to add a couple, but you can see here we've got, you know, we didn't want to add any dormers to the roof. We wanted to keep that clean triangular roof line. We didn't want to disrupt it. And so because of that, you've got this short knee wall and so, this was pretty much the only place we could put the window. Gives you just a different perspective in a way. Mm -hmm. And that's the light that we wake up with every morning at whenever sunrise is. Whether you like it or not. Yep, and <laughs> same here, if we don't shut the bathroom door at night, this one just blares right in at your face. <laughs> yep. Honey, close the bathroom door. Yep, it is every night. Same thing here, so technically, to have a shower, you need to have a certain amount of height. We were short that height. Again, we didn't want to add that ugly dormer. So the skylight was the solution. And then down here is our daughter's room. This is just like a sliding barn door. What's that up top there? Just clamps. Just stoppers. We had those in the basement and I stuck those on there. And then this is her room. So she is that same window there. Do you ever see people walk by? Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes, Sometimes yeah. What's wrong? This is something we just are still kind of finishing. It's almost done recently. I work from home. And so we wanted to just have a workspace for the two of us. Instead of building out cabinets or buying a cabinet system, we saw these filing cabinets on sale. So this is looking towards front kind of lookout window with a nice view of the tree, all sort of centered on the tree. See life go by. But he's gonna, um, he's gonna do a black house too.